All right, so it's been a while. Spring break sometimes jogs our memories. So let's review the second semester. All right, ready? Here we go. We were first introduced to this symbol in unit six. And this symbol to us meant antiderivative. And we would provide an answer one third x cubed plus two. Great. That was unit six. And then we changed gears, and all of a sudden we started talking about motion, and namely displacement like ending position versus initial position. And there are two ways to find displacement. You could take your velocity, that which you're traveling in, and multiplying by time. So like distance equals rate times time that you're used to. Uh, like 70 miles per hour over two hours gets you 140 miles. But we also talked about how you could find a change in a position. Like what's your starting position versus your ending position? And maybe this was uh, 180, uh, the, uh, like a mile marker. And this was like a mile marker of 40, you get 140. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, cool. Now, this half was easy if your velocity was constant. But if I told you your velocity was changing, like my velocity is t squared, okay, so I'm accelerating. The idea of velocity times time is tougher to do. Okay, but then we said, you know what? We could think about the idea behind it as like an area. T squared from zero to two, like velocity times time, ends up looking like an area. And then we said, you know what? Let's use this symbol again, but we'll change it. And we'll say, this means accumulate. And let's accumulate our t squared over their time from zero to two. And this gives us our velocity times the time. And if we had a calculator, our calculator could accumulate. Hooray, it can do this and it visually shows you that it's an area. Cool? But then we talked about how Isaac Newton discovered, well, if this is the velocity, you could take an antiderivative and find position get one-third t cubed plus c, but you won't need to see because when you plug in two and zero, you will cancel your c's and you get that eight-thirds. Now, what we found after last unit with the idea of a Riemann sum is that what your calculator does to accumulate is it does a complex Riemann sum and that what it's finding is an area. And this eight thirds, which is a change of an antiderivative, is also an area. So that is the second semester so far. Like antiderivative can be used to find accumulations, which are areas. And accumulations are change in antiderivatives or areas. This is confusing. Like it's a lot of stuff with one symbol. And I'm actually going to change that symbol to be more of like, oh, what do you do to accumulate to get an area? You take a sum, an, an infinite sum. And I'm going to shift your ideas in your brain to this unit so that you're very successful. So I, if I ask you this question, what's the area? You're like, well, if you accumulate x squared from 0 to 2, you'll get your area. How can you accumulate? Well, either with a calculator or without a calculator by taking an antiderivative. Got it? So get the answer, it's eight thirds, so I already gave it to you, you get it again. If you already did it, great. So, accumulate to find an error. Now, the first two lessons of this unit, just areas, okay? Nothing conceptual, just areas. But we're talking about areas between curves. Most of you 
conceptually would know how to find this area of this shaded yellow region. Okay? Tell your neighbors, how would you find that shaded yellow region's area? What would you do? A little too complicated. What do you think? How would you find the area? Write something down. Uh, don't go that crazy. Simple. Oh, yeah. Many of you are overcomplicating it. Many of you are, are right on top. Good. Yeah, perfect. So, many of you, not all, and it's okay if you didn't get it, I think in, if I found the area under F, which is this, which can be found by doing this, And then I find the area under G, which would be this, which can be represented by this, the accumulation of G, and subtract the two, bingo. Look at that yellow arrow. And you're correct. You are correct. You didn't get that? It's okay. Hopefully it makes sense to you now. Sometimes when I like review things, we make things a little bit complicated, but accumulating things gives us area. But I have to shift your thought process of things, okay? I actually don't want you to think about this as being an area anymore. I want you to think about an integral being a sum, an infinite sum. An accumulation is an infinite sum. Okay? It's very important to make this shift for this unit. Because when we accumulate x squared times dx, what we are doing is we are taking an infinite sum of rectangle areas, height times width. I will want you to start, and for every single problem we're about to do, drawing a representative rectangle. Go ahead and draw one from this first problem. This is a rectangle. That's a rectangle. Rectangles have height and width. If we take the height times the width, we get an area. Why this accumulation is area is because we are taking an infinite sum of height times width. That's area. Now, what's the height? The height is this y distance. The y distance was given to us by taking an x and squaring it. y equals x squared. What's the width? Well, this rectangle is very skinny, right? It looks like it's a line, but it's a rectangle. It's a very skinny rectangle, which means the width is very small. Okay, don't do it all. Which means if it's a small change in x, we say it's a dx. Why is this area? Because it's an infinite sum of height times width. That's why it's an area. A lot of you don't even include the dx because you don't know why it's necessary. Like it doesn't mean anything. I'm going to take an antiderivative anyways. It's like, well, it is necessary or else it won't be an area. 
So what I want you guys to do from now on, when I'm asking you to find an area, is start with a rectangle. Draw a rectangle. Okay? The rectangle has two characteristics. It's a height and a width. The width is very easy to lift. The width is a small x distance. We are going to infinite sum heights and widths of these blue rectangles. I'm drawing one, but think about an infinite amount of these blue rectangles between A and B. Okay? They all have heights. They all have width and dx. Now, the height is a y distance, just like the height of this rectangle was a y distance. Now, the height of this rectangle was this y distance determined by x squared. What is this y distance going to be? We don't know. It, it changes. But we always know it, what it's going to be determined by. Right. So for this one example, I can use a number, but I don't want to use numbers because it confuses students. Like I could say, if this was a y coordinate of three and this was a y coordinate of one, you could subtract these two and you get a y distance of two. That makes sense, right? Well, you could take the y at the top and subtract the y at the bottom. Now, the y at the top is given to you by f of x, y equals f of x. The y at the bottom is given to you by y equals g of x. So I could say, oh, f of x minus g of x gives me a y distance determined by subtracting two y coordinates. We'll sum these up from a to b, and boom. This is the new way I wish you to understand area not as an integral means an accumulation it means like overall area but an integral means an infinite sum and we're summing up rectangles heights and width okay this is what we first, we started to do last unit with Riemann sum to understand an integral is actually an infinite sum that connection okay cool in all lesson, we're just going to be talking about areas, and we're going to try to get the areas not with two integrals of two different things, just with one integral using rectangles that, that represent things. Okay? Now, skip this, we'll come back to this. But actually, we won't come back to this. We will, but uh, after we write things. Now, with areas, you've been told that if you have like a region, below the x-axis, you'd consider the area negative, right? You guys comfortable with that? What I'm telling you is that if you're asked to find an area of a region that's enclosed by multiple curves, area is always positive. Even if both of your curves dipped underneath the x-axis, you would consider this area positive. Now, here's what I'm going to do. And you guys are going to do this. Draw a rectangle, a skinny rectangle. Recognize it's got a height and it's a width. We will sum up said height and width no matter where the rectangle is located. The width will always be a very small x distance. dx is a very small x distance. The height is a y distance. Now, let's see. For the previous one, 
I took the Y at the top, and I subtracted the Y at the bottom. And that gave me a positive height. And I want positive height so that I have positive area. Using two numbers as an example, if you take negative 1 and subtract negative 3, the top minus the bottom, do you get a positive height? Good. Yes, negative 1 minus negative 3 is negative 1 plus 3. That gives you 2. So that's good. Now, no matter where I am, don't necessarily always going to have negative 1, negative 3. But using a top minus a bottom gives you a correct positive height. Now, this top y is given to me by y equals p of x. The bottom y is given to me by y equals m of x. Okay? And we will start at A and go to B. This is what our calculator shows us. It starts on the left. It goes to the right. It is not in between these two numbers. Order matters. That makes sure that the width is positive. And the same thing will happen if we're like crossing the x-axis. Top minus bottom will work to give us positive height. So if we want to ensure the area is always positive, we're talking about between multiple curves. And we want to use just one integral. We want to sum up our heights and our width. The heights will always be my y distance to the top minus my y distance to the bottom. Subtracting the two, we'll get that positive distance. Now, the y distance will be given to us by equation. y equals x's equation. So we'll just list off the x's in there. The width is always a very small change in x. To ensure that the widths are always positive, we go from a left point to a right point. Okay, let's see that in action. Okay, here's our first enclosed region. It straddles an axis, but we want to get a positive answer. You got a bunch of equations. Y equals X squared plus 2, Y equals negative X, X equals 0, X equals 1. What's missing from this problem that we had on all the, the other examples that we looked at so far? Yeah, we, we can't see it, right? We can't see it. We, we had a graph. So a sketch is always going to help. But, like, what do we notice? We have a Y. We have a second Y. So one of these is a top and one of these is a bottom. And then we have two Xs. Well, we can kind of tell which one's the left and which is the right. But let's just sketch really quickly so we can see it and understand it. X equals 0 is just the Y axis. X equals 1 is just a vertical line to the right. We have the x-axis if we want. Doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to do the whole sketch. Just between 0 and 1, y equals negative x. Well, that's easy. It's like 0, 0, 1, negative 1, just a straight line. y equals x squared plus 2. Oh, that's easy, too. That's just 0, 2, and 1, 3 with some sort of curve connecting it. Do you see the region? If you were to shade it like I'm doing, do so very gently. Very gently because this is not the important part. The important part is your one rectangle that you will sum up. One is a representative of all of them that you're going to sum up. You'll say, okay, I want to sum up the areas of these rectangles. They have height and they have width. The widths are very, very small x distances because that is the width of this skinny rectangle, the x. The height is a y distance. The y distance is taken by finding the top y and subtracting the bottom y.
Okay. You're summing them up from a left to a right. All right, write down what goes in the interval. See if you can do it. It's important for you to try it this first time. The y at the top is equal to x squared plus 2. The y at the bottom is equal to negative x. So this is the whole, like, oh, use, like, the equation that's given to you, the y equals x equation. Here's the y top minus the y bottom. From 0 to 1. All right. This is the most important part of this entire unit, setting it up correctly, understanding where the setup comes from. The next part is actually not as important. You still need to know how to do it. It's to like be able to evaluate this. Give me one way to evaluate this. The easiest way to get the evaluation of this integral. No, no, easier, easier. You have anything at your disposal? Calculator. <laughs> so a lot of people see the parentheses, they think you substitution. But like, no, what you guys have been doing, which is just like that, like you don't, there's no use substitution involved. Some people thought about this earlier. Really. But no, no, guess what? You have a calculator. If you have a calculator, if I said, hey, you have a calculator. Well, you got to set it up and then plug it into your calculator. All right, plug it into your calculator. Don't forget, our calculator can do advanced dream on sums very quickly. Come on, let's learn something. Yeah, 2.833333333. Great. Now, remember, don't plug an antiderivatives into your calculator. Like your calculator, math 9, you plug that in. Everybody cool with that? I got to make sure you can. Like, you can do math 9. Plug in exactly what you see in your calculator does an advanced Riemann sum to get what usually ends up being the exact answer. But sometimes we'll be a little bit off because it is doing a Riemann sum and it is uh, technically like approximating. Cool? Now, let's say we don't have a calculator. Again, this is not the most important part. The important part is the setup. If you don't have a calculator, what do you have to do? Anti-derive. Now, let's get that answer that we got with our calculator this other way using Mr. Newton and the idea that you can take an antiderivative. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Newt one, net one. <laughs> Use Mr. Newton, who connected antiderivatives and areas. Go. We take the antiderivative. Include this plus C, but it's not necessary because it'll go away when we subtract. We plug in 1. We plug in 0, 1 third plus 2 plus 1 half is 2 6 plus 12 6 plus 3 6, which is 17 6. Okay? This answer, you have to be able to get it, sure, but it's actually, it, you can't get it unless you have the correct setup. The setup is the important part. This is what we need to focus on y top minus y bottom. That's the height of this rectangle. The width, skinny x distance. Got it? Skip one, go to this one. Yeah, you might, you know, quickly realize something. You might be like, oh, Mr. Messner is giving me two y's. 
So there's a top and a bottom there. Give me two X's. So there's a left and a right. I'm going to skip the whole thing, and I'm just going to say left to right, Y top minus Y bottom, I'm done. Okay? Cool? You can write that down if you want. And let's say Mr. Mess is giving me the calculator. Great. I'm just going to plug this in. And I'm going to get the right answer because I'm a lazy student who thinks they can take shortcuts. And lazy students who take shortcuts think they know better than teachers who've been doing this for 10 years. And they press enter, and, and they know it's going to be a positive answer, right? It's going to be a positive answer because areas between curves are always positive. And you press enter, and you get a negative answer. Which means this must be wrong. Now, you might be thinking, oh, Mr. Messner typed something in wrong into their calculator, but no. That's not it. Mr. Messner could put, ready? Mr. Messner could insert parentheses. And even after inserting parentheses, it's still wrong. You see that? Isn't that nice inserting? There you go. Uh, so what did I do wrong? Yes, 1 over x is just a fraction if you sketched it between 1 and e, y equals 4 is up here. 1 over x would be down there. Here's your region. Here is your rectangle whose height is a top minus bottom but the top is y equals 4, the bottom is y equals 1 over x. So it should be 4 minus 1 over x. Well, you know what? I don't know. I kind of think I know what this answer is going to be. What did you say, Trian? Yeah. Why? Because I'm flipping the height. This is important, guys. This is an important thing to realize. What if we flip the height? What if we do a bottom minus the top? Let's go back and see. What if, using our numbers, instead of doing 3 minus 1, I did 1 minus 3? I'd get negative 2, the opposite of the height that I wanted to get, the positive 2. What if I did, you know, negative one minus negative, uh, negative three minus negative one, I'd get negative two. This is very important. What we realize if we mess up, and if we're going from left to right, we accidentally do a Y on the bottom minus a Y on the top. The Y on the bottom minus the Y on the top would be a negative height. The opposite of the height that we're looking for. Multiplying by a width, we get the opposite of the area we're looking for. Okay, cool. That's cool. Well, man, I'm a high school student. I like to take the easiest way out. I like to use shortcuts instead of doing a little bit more work. I feel like there's something in my calculator that could be used so that my height were always positive. My areas were always positive. You guys are right on the money. If you want to ensure your heights are always positive, you could take an absolute value and take the y of either and subtract the y of the other, and it will ensure that if it's a negative height, it turns into a positive height. If it's a positive height, it keeps us a positive height. So you could do this. Now, this is more like important to understand conceptually. It's important to know that like it, it works. It's important to know now I can't insert an absolute value. That's one thing that is not insertable. 
But if I use an absolute value and mess up and do 1 over x minus 4, this would give me the positive correct answer, even though I messed things up and I did a bottom minus the top. Okay? You could use this to like check answers, but your test will be like half calculator, half no calculator. There will be some questions where you have to have this form because that's what's listed as your options, A, B, C, D. They will ask you what is an integral that would give you the correct area. And you would have to list off your integral correctly, understanding the top and the bottom. You can't cheat and use an absolute value. You would have to select this answer. You have to select this answer, not that answer. Okay? Now, again, evaluating this is secondary in terms of importance. You still have to do it. You still have to either use your calculator and plug it in, easy, or take an antiderivative and plug in E and plug in 1. Not as easy, but, like, you have to be able to do it. Okay? But we're not going to spend that much time because it is secondary. Okay? Now, all four, all the two of these examples, we skipped the one in the middle, we're going to come back to it, were, were easy because it's like I gave you two Y's, I gave you two X. I will not always give you two Y's and two X. Sometimes I'll just give you two Y's and one X. Sometimes, I'm just going to give you two Y and no X. You might be thinking, well, Mr. Mister, you're not giving me enough information. Nope, I'm giving you all that you need. And again, it's all about the setup. Let me walk you through this one. You got Y equals X cubed. Y equals 8. X equals 0. Here's my region. Here's my representative rectangle. It has a height and a width. I will sum up these heights times the width. Please write down what are the heights of all of my rectangles in my region. Write it down, everybody. You have to try. What is the Y top minus the Y bottom? Yes. The y at the top is given to you by y equals 8. The y at the bottom is given to you by y equals x cubed. So if you put 8 minus x cubed in here, great job. If you put dx right here, great job. If you said 0 right here, great job. If you gave up, it's okay. But if you figured out where the missing piece of information comes from and what it is, great job. What is it? Two. Why two? Because you see where they intersect. Maybe not use blue. The intersection. The intersection when the two equations equal each other will give us a missing piece of information. Sometimes it's easy enough to just kind of figure out x cubed, y equals 8, intersected 2. Boom, you have your setup. You could take the antiderivative and find the answer if you didn't have a calculator. This would be a no calculator question all the way. So go ahead. Give me the area. You can't use your calculator. Go. The setup, everything, no calculator. A quiz next class with half no calculator, half question. The answer is 12. Good. Mr. Newton helps us. 16 minus 4 minus a big fat 0 is 12. That area is just 12. Right? But just because I give you a calculator, Gonna change up, go up to the top one. 
Going to change it up. Get rid of the two. Two's gone. Two's gone. Not y equals negative one. So y equals x plus two. Cool? Okay. You may use your calculator for all parts of this question. Please find the area of this region enclosed. Let me. Yo, Arnold, that's you. That's me. Oh, it's my iPad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the top. I changed the I changed the example. So since you have your calculator, what can you use to help you sketch? Yeah. Your calculator. x plus 2 e to the x, can you graph x equals 0? No, so don't try. I zoomed in a little bit earlier. Now, oh, forgot to say something. Um, I would probably distinguish which half of things by saying in the first quadrant. My bad. First quadrant. My bad. So we are talking about this region here, okay? Where you got y equals e to the x on the bottom, y equals x plus two on the top, okay? Again, just like the last problem, I have three of the four parts of the setup. I have my height y top minus y bottom. The y on the top is the x plus 2. y equals x plus 2 is the top. I have the bottom, which is y equals e to the x. I have the start. I can attempt to find the intersection by setting the equations equal to each other. Yikes. Don't know how to solve that equation. So what do you do? Yeah, you find the intersection using your calculator. Second calc intersect, pop over there. Enter, enter, enter. Guess what's gonna help us? My friend store. This intersection x equals 1.146. Maybe I'll write it down here just so I have it, 1.146. But use a dot, dot, dot. We're not gonna round that because we need to use the entire number to get an answer, and the answer we can round. So maybe we go back and uh, x is stored as that 1.146. Maybe we store x as a. We'll be doing that a lot. I don't know if I do it on the homework videos. This year has been the year of store. But you would type this into your calculator. Yes, the year of store. Math nine zero two a uh, x plus two minus e to the x. Depending on if you have calculator or no calculator, yeah, you know, that's how you find your intersection. Okay, got point eight zero three. We're gonna hold on to that. Got that done. Cool. No. What if? What if? I don't give you any X's. And I don't have a calculator. You don't have a calculator. We have a situation where they will intersect twice. A upside down parabola, Y equals X they will intersect twice. The problem is I'm not even including the X and the Y axis here. I don't know where they intersect. Where's the start, where's the end? 
I do know what the y top is. Y equals 2 minus x squared is the top. Y at the bottom, I could tell is y equals x, just because I know what the shape of 2 minus x squared looks like. Now, if you had your calculator, you use second calculator stick, but that's cheating. You don't have your calculator. How do you find the intersection? Set them equal to each other. How do you solve this equation? Yep. It's your friend, the quadratic. Oh, boy. You get x equals negative 2 and positive 1. The setup, again, is the important part. There's your setup. You could find that without a calculator. It would take you a while. Most of the questions on uh, this unit is just really like end with the setup. Get the setup and you're good. Not for this first lesson. So this first lesson, I'll ask you, no calculator, find it, calculator, find it, you know, depending on the situation. Cool. All right. What if we intersected at three locations? No, I, I, the setup is the important part. All right, tell your neighbors, what should we do? Go. There is two ways to do this. <laughs> there are two ways to do this. The one way, most of you think about, split it up. From A to B, your top is F, your bottom is G. So your height is F minus G. So A to B, F minus G times DX because it's the width of your rectangle. Don't forget about DX or else you don't get an area. And then from B to C, height. So the, the presentation today was supposed to be 45 minutes. They were supposed to be back 25 minutes ago. He's too motivated. The height is G minus F. G minus F. Great. Or I could do this with one integral from A to C. How? Hey, smarty pants. I could do this. With one integral. If you use an absolute value, it doesn't matter what you do. F minus G, oh, that's a positive height. But over here, F minus G would be a negative height. But the absolute value would turn it into a positive height. So one integral. It's needed if you have a calculator and you can use the absolute value. Now, this next example is a situation where we have like a cubic and a quadratic that intersect at like multiple locations. We go through, if you wanted to, the whole A to B, B to C splitting up or A to C of one thing and you see how it's equal to each other. We don't have time to do that example because I need to get to the most important question, the culminating question, where I'm going to let you use your calculator for the entire question. So it can't be that bad, right? Yeah. Can't be that bad because I'm going to let you use a calculator. But this is the question of the day. You're allowed to use your calculator, great. It involves everything that we've learned, really, so far in the second semester. It's actually the same region that we talked about. 
We got x equals 0, x equals 1. We got y equals x squared plus 2, something like that. We got y equals negative x, something like that. Here's our region. We drew a rectangle. We found the area. What was the area again? You guys remember that number? Yeah, can I have a more exact number? 17.6, great. We said, oh, from 0 to 1, from left to right, the height was the y at the top, which is y equals x squared plus 2. The y at the bottom was y equals negative x. And we got 17.6. Great, I already did that, but that's not the question. But that work will be used. Okay. The question is, find the value k such that x equals k splits the area of the region into two equal parts. So there is some line, x equals k, that splits this into two equal parts. Okay? Now, here is the question I'm going to give you. Do you think k is at 0.5? No. no. You can kind of tell that it would be what? Bigger than or less than 0.5? All right, so it's going to be something a little bit bigger than 0.5. Good. You're at least that's cute in your observation. But I need to set something up like some sort of equation that K is involved in that I could potentially solve. Let's just not worry about the solving part. Let's worry about the setup. Tell your neighbors what would be a setup. I need a setup first. What would be a good setup? Maybe involving integral or integral. All right, who's got a setup? Who's got some sort of setup involving integral? Jane, what do you got? What? What do you got? Oh my goodness. If we already know the area and white, most of us, most students do this. If this splits it in half, an integral from 0 to k of the top minus the bottom must equal an integral from k to 1. This is what most students do. White already went to the fact that we know the overall area, which means one half of it will be half of that area, or 17 twelfths. So I actually prefer not to use this way. This is one way. Here's the preferred setup, which involves less work. Zero to K, we like using zero. It's a nice number to work with. Of top minus bottom equals one half my area. Great. But, guys, that's just a setup. We need to solve for k. Now, our calculator can solve equations. It can find intersections. We could potentially try to graph the left side and the right side. However, what have I told you never to do before, Arnold? Graph an integral. It takes seconds to accumulate just between two points. Using multiple variables will take your calculator forever. Eventually, it'll give up. So I need to get rid of the integral somehow. You have a calculator, but you need to get rid of the integral. How do I get rid of the integral? Yes, this is why I love this question, because I'm letting you use your calculator for everything. But you still have to take an antiderivative. You have to use Newton or Newton. But preferably Newton, you have to take the antiderivative because the antiderivative will get rid of the integral. You have to plug in k and zero. This is the step a lot of people forget is that you need to plug in k. And it just so happens for this example, the next example we're going to do, it's not going to happen. When we plug in zero, we get zero. Now we have an equation 
that can be solved using a calculator. Got to do it really quickly. I know we have K's, but I'm going to re-replace them with X's. We're looking for something a little bit bigger than 0.5, right? Yeah. Let's see. Point five eight eight. Sounds good? Sounds good to me. Don't believe me? Store this value, go zero to that value, and you're going to get 1712. I don't want to spend the time doing this because I want to get to the next example, but I'm going to do it just because. Oh, I've got to store that value. X. Store it as A. Okay, I'll store it as D. Math 9, 0 to D of X squared plus 2 plus X. You get 17, 12. Wait, I think it's the... Uh, okay. Wait, why did you only say Y equals 12? It's not Y equals 17. It is 17 over 12. Oh, okay. Just, yeah. okay. Now... Other example. No, we got to do this one. X equals 2 is gone. Y equals negative 1 was replaced by Y equals X plus 2. Got three minutes to do this. Here it was. The area was 0 0.803. Set up an equation that can be solved to split this area in half. And then do the first step at least to solve it. Found this earlier. Point eight oh three. I'm gonna take that and split it in half. I get point four oh one five. I'm gonna have to store that value. Because I'm gonna use it in my equation. Here's the Ticket, guys. This is what everybody messes up on. And you will have to do this or you will not do well in your quiz because we'll have multiple of these questions. You have to get rid of the integral by taking the antiderivative. You have to plug in k. And you have to plug in 0. And when I plug in 0, I don't always get 0. I get 0 plus 0 minus e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1. This is important, and sometimes I'm not going from 0 to k. Sometimes I'm going to go from 1 to k or something like that. So I have 1 half k squared plus 2k minus e to the k minus negative 1 or plus 1. This equals 0 0.4015. I already stored 0 0.4015 as A. I will graph the other side, find the intersection, and this will split my region into two equal parts. This is the problem of the day, which incorporates finding areas, which forces you to take an antiderivative, even though I'm letting you use a calculator for all these parts. It is the question. I hope you guys get motivated tomorrow.
golf course you divided by four, right? Uh, no. No, no. I'm just saying, like, put the area in half, which is why I take the area divided by two. There won't be four sections. If I say, like, divide it into four, maybe. But I don't ask to divide it into four. Does that make sense? What what question are you talking about that has four sections? It was one of the ones on the homework, and there were two sections. He divided it by four, and then three divided by two. I'll put the work at it again.